Now, before we get into the music, let us first find out who exactly Lucretia was, or is. Lucretia was a woman from Roman history slash myth, or mytho-history if you will. She was a noble woman married to Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, who would later on become one of the first two consuls of the Roman Republic. The story about her takes place during the period known as the Roman Monarchy. This was before Rome became a republic and about 500 years before the Roman Empire would be declared under Augustus Caesar. The story of Lucretia takes place around 508 BC, but there is some debate over the exact date. The story here has a lot of non-YouTube friendly terms, so to avoid the demonetization hammer, I will use other words, but I am sure you can figure it out. And this is not to downplay the severity of any of the things that happened to her in any way. This is just so this video can stay monetized. Her story, described by the Roman historians Livy and Dionysus of Halicarnassus, is as follows. The Roman king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, was preoccupied besieging a city. He sent his son, Sextus Tarquinius, to an errand in the town of Calatia which is about 15 kilometers away from Rome. And there are a few versions of the events which transpire, but the main story is that during the visit, Sextus Tarquinius and Lucius Calatinus and other men were drinking wine and debating the virtues of their wives. You know, as one does when out with the boys. To settle a debate on whose wife is the most virtuous, the men decided to surprise and visit each of their wives at home. Now, most of the wives were found socializing with other women or servants. Yet, Lucretia, Lucius's wife, was found working alone, a model of dedication to her husband. It was here that the son of the king, Sextus Tarquinius, became infatuated with lust towards Lucretia. Accounts differ, but later on, Sextus would sneak into Lucretia's bedroom and commit essay upon her, giving her two choices, either she allow herself to be defiled by him, or he would unalive her and one of her male servants and claim that he had found them together in adultery. Having no other choice, Lucretia was then essayed by the son of the king. In another version of the story, before the assault happened, Lucretia was offered all the temptations that a son of the king could offer her. Money, extravagance, wealth, power, etc. But she refused all his proposals, exemplifying her temperance, self-restraint, and dedication to her husband. Afterwards, distraught and devastated, she sends messengers for her father and her husband to come quickly with witnesses. As they return to her, she explained what had happened to her, and in one account, she is said to have stated to them, quote, And whereas I, for I am a woman, shall act in a manner which is fitting for me, you, if you are men, and if you care for your wives and your children, exact vengeance on my behalf, and free yourselves, and show the tyrants what sort of woman they outraged, and what sort of men were her men folk, end quote which then she promptly drew a dagger and committed control alt delete and task to herself this act of virtuosity on her part according to one account in the story is quote this dreadful scene struck the romans who were present with so much horror and compassion that they all cried out with one voice that they would rather die a thousand deaths in defense of their liberty than suffer such outrages to be committed by the tyrants end quote Thus, the essay and self-end task of Lucretia would spark the events which would overthrow the tyrant kings of Rome and would lead to the establishment of the Roman Republic, which would then last for nearly 500 years. I encourage you to go read the account of Livy himself or to find one of the many excellent history videos on the Roman monarchy republic for more information. The story of Lucretia is important for many reasons, not only for the establishment of the Roman Republic, but for also becoming a symbol of chastity, purity, devotion, temperance, moderation, and self-control. Otherwise described as sophrosyne, Lucretia has been used as an example and symbol of sophrosyne by numerous authors, playwrights, painters, and musicians, including, but not limited to, St. Augustine, Dante, Machiavelli, Shakespeare, and Dave Mustaine? Okay, Varvis, you know, this is all great, but what does this story have to do with Megadeth? Well, I'm here to argue that Lucretia is a song about muses, not the band muse, but the old usage of the word. In fact, the word muse, or in ancient Greek, musa, is the root word for our modern English word music, museum, etc. There are countless examples of muses throughout history, but to make a long story short, a muse is a spirit, goddess, god, force, or literal person which acts as one's artistic inspiration or guidance for life. This is who Lucretia is in this song. Dave Mustaine's muse. She is muse of temperance and purity and self-control, which we can interpret here as his muse for sobriety.
The intro riff here remi always reminds me of a fairy or spirit dancing. Played in the key of C sharp minor, its arpeggiated chords, which are played in a descending pattern, half palm muted, gives a very whimsical feeling to it. It bounces around on three chords from C sharp minor flat six to C sharp minor and to C sharp minor seven. The flat six and minor seventh chords are missing the fifth interval, but that is of little matter. The fifth of a chord gives little information besides the fullness of the chord. This pattern is very unique and seldom heard in thrash metal. It just instantly grabs your attention. To me, this intro riff sounds like a spirit, or in this case, a muse dancing around one's head, floating around in the air. You can almost picture it to that guitar riff. The guitar runs that follow and the drumming also accentuate this feeling. As the intro continues, the other instruments echo the whimsical feeling and the song begins to build, until we move on to the first thrash metal part of the song. The vocals and first lyrics of the song finally join in here as well. As the vocals come in, the key changes to F-sharp Phrygian. Here, in the first verse, the lyrics are as follows. Sitting up, late at night, I tiptoe through the darkness. Cold as hell, black as spades. Aware of my immediate surroundings, in my place, I escape up into my hideout, hiding from everyone. My friends all say, Dave, you're mental anyway. Hey, drift into a deeper state. I stalk the cobwebbed stairways, dirt grits beneath my feet. The stair creaks, I precariously sneak. Yeah, here Dave is relating a story of doing something which everyone around him would disapprove of. In the book Rust in Peace, Dave Mustaine on the passage about the song Lucretia would say, quote, I could remember when I was sneaking through the houses, getting loaded, how my life had sunk to such a level of debauchery and hiding stuff from everybody. I was reminded, I was reminded of my loft at the studio. That was a place I could escape, up into my hideout, hiding from everyone. End quote. This entire first lyrical section is Dave reminiscing of a time in his life when he was using drugs. Dave was famously sober on Rust in Peace, so that the writing of the song must have been a cathartic experience to him, to relieve those dark moments of using. And as a side note, I always enjoy how Dave Mustaine references himself in third person in various songs. It could come off as very corny and cheesy, but somehow Dave Mustaine always seems to pull it off. I also enjoy how the verse moves to a different key that from the intro this time f sharp phrygian f sharp phrygian is a little bit more of a darker sound to the regular minor scale having the flattened second there it's a very nice touch that gives the verse sort of a darker feeling from just the regular c sharp minor intro as the verse ends we get to the heaviest and darkest riff of the entire track This riff here is the simplest so far, relying heavily on the dark Phrygian flat second sound, reflecting the extremely dark and down moments that perhaps Dave was reflecting upon when writing. However, in this dark moment, his muse reappears. The intro section repeats, albeit just a little bit shorter and with some different drumming. Dave Mustaine's muse, Lucretia, reappearing, dancing around him, giving him strength and inspiration, taking him back away from the dark, cold, dirty, and cobweb-infested hideout he was singing about. The lyrics in the second verse are as follows. Hypnosis guides my hand. I slip slide through the walkways. Sit in Granny's rocking chair. Memories are whirling by. Yeah. Reminisce in the attic. Lucretia waits impatiently. Cobwebs make me squint. The cobra so eloquently glints. Moonbeams surge through the sky. The crystal ball is energized. Surely that, like the cat waiting. Lucretia rocks away. Hey. Hypnosis guiding his hand may refer to the powerful pull towards a substance that many people with the disease of addiction feel. It is like one is hypnotized and the decision is not your own. You are acting on autopilot. Your, you know, your own brain is taking over and you're just a passenger. Lucretia joins him up in the attic, 
waiting impatiently for him to come back to himself. He references a crystal ball, which is often used as a story device to perceive future events. The moonlight illuminates and energizes the crystal ball, and Lucretia, his muse, is with him. Both of them up in the attic with the energized crystal ball. To me, this is all a metaphor for struggling with addiction. The crystal ball being the path which is shown if the addiction is given into. Lucretia, his muse, is waiting with him impatiently, waiting for him to make the right choice, hoping to guide him and show him the right way. As the second verse ends with Lucretia sitting in Granny's rocking chair, we go back to the heavy Phrygian riff. Instead of moving back to the intro, it moves to a section which is similar to the intro, but different. First of all, it's in a different key, played a little bit differently, a little bit different arpeggiated chords. It almost feels like we're being taken somewhere, but through this riff. Which is true as we've been taken to the solo section. To me here, it is like we are watching the crystal ball and the riff is us being sucked into the world of the crystal ball. The world of showing us what the addiction is. Thus, we are taken to the solo section. The two solos here, one played by lead guitarist Marty Friedman and the other by Dave Mustaine. Marty Friedman's solo is very beautiful and effervescent. It is almost like the muse is speaking out loud through Marty's fingers. Or rather, Marty Friedman is channeling his inner guitar god to make a solo sound like how a muse would talk. If you want some more details on the solo, check out this video. He did an excellent job on it. Marty Friedman uses all sorts of exotic scales during his solo here, so this is an excellent watch. Lucretia, Dave's muse, is imploring him to stay clean and to channel her temperance into him. The solo rises and falls beautifully. There's major and minor sections and arpeggios. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. What a wonderful, wonderful solo. It, truly, Marty Freeman's one of the greatest guitarists of all time, and his guitar work on Rust in Peace has to be right up there. The riff underneath echoes this as well. It is similar to the intro riff, despite being the key of F-sharp minor rather than the C-sharp minor like the intro but it still retains the sort of arpeggiated feeling. It's very cool. If the first solo from Marty was the muse speaking to Dave, the Dave solo was his rebuttal. Dave's solo is much more violent and intense, less beautiful and more aggressive. It is like the two of them are battling it out over control. Dave's solo is like the devil on your shoulder which is another example of muses in popular culture, but this time for nefarious or evil purposes. He is telling himself, hey, remember how much fun it was? How much you enjoyed it? How much, how much trouble you could get into? How exciting it is? Echoing this is that we have the riff from the verses here again, which is an F-sharp Phrygian rather than Marty's, which is just an F-sharp minor. This echoes the darker feel and sort of brings together some cohesiveness, some continuity from the verses to the solo sections. One of my favorite moments in any solo ever here is the moment which I've heard someone describe as falling up the stairs. Oh man, it's just so good. It really does remind me of falling up the stairs, or what could also be interpreted as going from sober to intoxicated very quickly. The run going from the very lowest notes on the guitar to the very highest in a sort of intoxicated, slurring manner. Ah, oh, it's wonderful. As the solo ends, we get to the part which is similar to the sections which end the verse, but this time it's a little bit more intense. <laughs> And after one amazing drum fill, which I always remember to air drum to, the song ends. And it's unclear whether or not Lucretia the Temperance Muse was able to keep Dave away. And that was Lucretia. Now, to wrap things up, let me just read you a quick quote again from the Rust in Peace book. Quote, Lucretia is a subject of much controversy. People want to know who Lucretia is. 
They tell me I spelt her name wrong. They have all sorts of opinions about the song, but they are all wrong. I wrote the song about some make-believe thing in my head, and I named her Lucretia. I don't even know who this is. I made it all up, and I can spell her name any way I want to. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. You just have to love Dave Mustaine. I just love his matter-of-fact, no BS attitude towards, towards this stuff. Well, of course, it is his song, and it can be about or not be about anything that he chooses. As I have said many times before in my other deep dives, the best art can be interpreted many ways. You know, everyone has a different opinion on what the Mona Lisa is smiling at, right? And once art is sort of released into the world, it can sort of take on a life of its own and people can read their own meanings into art. So with Lucretia, we can choose to look at it the way I interpreted it, or you can choose to look at the way Dave does. I will say though, individuals do not exist in a cultural vacuum. Despite the fact that Dave says he does not know who she is, I would counter-argue that over 2,500 years of cultural osmosis could have subconsciously caused him to use her name for this song, which is a song about addiction and temperance, purposefully. That is, he may have heard her name used in the Shakespeare play or an, or an art gallery somewhere, and these sort of terms and symbols in our culture are deeply ingrained in our stories and everything like that. You can look up the work of Carl Jung for a lot of this, but, but you know, synchronicities and coincidences are a funny thing. It requires both ends of the party to be present for it to happen. So essentially what I'm saying here is that perhaps Dave using the name Lucretia was not an accident, despite the fact that he thinks it was. And and with the way that the song's constructed and the lyrics and the riffs are very fairy and muse-like, it seems like this had to be more than a coincidence, is what I'm saying here, if that makes any sense to you guys. Anyways, what do you think of Lucretia? Was I looking too deeply into things? Do you agree with me? You know, leave your thoughts down below. I always enjoy reading your thoughts on these matters. You know, you guys are all very intelligent and have made me rethink many, many things. I have more songs coming, so always remember to like and subscribe for more. Cheers.